Okay, welcome into the Milwaukee Bucks on Tap podcast, episode five. Corey Moen, Evan Burns. Evan, the Bucks had two games this week, both against Detroit. Uh, they had a nail biter on Monday night, one ten to ninety eight, and then it helped me fill in the score for Wednesday. But they just emasculated them Wednesday night. <clears throat> yeah, it was. Monday was a lot of back and forth. They got a little run at points, but it wasn't like anything huge where I felt comfortable. Or when it did, they just gave it right back up. Uh, I would say the biggest part was the three ball. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah, so the Bucks won yesterday's game. Or Yeah, okay. Uh, so, excuse me. Wednesday's game, 116-91. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, me and Ever are kind of going to discuss the two games here. Um, so let's just kind of get right into it. Evan, the first thing I noticed from Monday night's game was how comfortable Drew Holiday looked offensively. 16 first half points, three, uh, I believe three threes, two or three mm -hmm. threes. Um, but he, he had a, he did have a rough, start to the season, but now he's kind of coming into his own. Yeah, he he seems to fit his role a lot more. Uh, I think he's figuring out a way to score, get to the hoop a lot better, but uh, able to hit that three ball a lot better. He ended up with five threes. Um, I would say the biggest thing is feeling comfortable, feeling alive out there, and I think he's doing a lot better um as as the games go by i agree with you there and i've said this that i'm not worried about drew holiday's offensive output no. i'm not drew holiday is one of those <laughs> is one of those players that can affect a game more so than on the offensive end mm -hmm. he can affect a game defensively um you know with rebounding just playing great defense and that's what we expect from Drew Holiday. Like, if he has a great offensive game, great. But he's one of the – again, he's one of those players that if he doesn't have a great game offensively, that's fine mm -hmm. because he's going to be in that crunch time and he's going to make some big-time plays. Yeah, that three he had at the end of the game was really clutch. Um, <clears throat> he was kind of on a, a down end from there, and the confidence with that shot, I think – led him to having a really good game overall. Yeah, because um and we'll kind of get into it uh we'll kind of get into it in a little bit later, but before Drew Holiday's three, like Milwaukee did not play well in that second half mm -hmm. at all. Um you know they Drew Holiday saved them that game because it just seemed like um, they were they slept a walk, especially in the second half. Yeah, their their fourth quarter, they only scored twenty two points. Mm. They were outscored by nine. We can obviously tell because they only won by two. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of back and forth in the third quarter. Only outscored them by three. But yeah, that fourth quarter, they really fell apart. The three ball wasn't there, and a lot of mm. a lot of turnovers and just dumb fouls. Mm. <clears throat> that are not all causing turnovers, causing them to shoot free throws when it's not needed. Yeah, and and I believe on Monday's game, Detroit had twelve steals. I want to say it was a real, it was an extreme. It was too high for my liking. Yes, I think you're right with twelve. Twelve steals. That's too high. That's way too high for Milwaukee to be turning the ball over. You know, turnovers, it, it happens, okay? You know, every NBA team turns the ball over. You know, some mm. games are higher than others. 12 is too high. Just it, it, It's way too high. It's just being lazy with the basketball, just just chucking it to the other team, and it's, it's just negative possessions that just don't – it it doesn't need to happen. Just double-checked it was nine, but nine still steals. nine is a lot. Nine steals. That's too high. Mm -hmm. that's, still, that's still too high. Um, and what, which kind of brings me to my next point, speaking about how well Detroit played on Monday, 
Um, you know, sometimes this podcast, we have to compliment the other team. Okay. Bucks don't always play well. Um, so I felt after rewatching the game on Monday that Cade Cunningham got way too many open looks in the first half. Mm -hmm. Um, he had 19 first half points, but only ended the game with 27 after, uh, coach Boonhoser made the switch to put Drew Holiday on Cunningham. Yep which helped out a lot because Drew Holiday's great about pressuring the basketball and, you know, you know, just disturbing like young players and stuff like that. But I think to start the game, he had Grayson Allen on him and he had Javon Carter and he could basically get whatever he wanted. I felt, I felt like there was too many wide open threes and too many uh, drives to the basket. Yeah. He's a taller guard. He's six, six. Uh, and when you put guys on him like Grayson Allen, who's six four, again two inches doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. Um, <clears throat> but that overall, again, he played actually really well. I like, sorry, I like him a lot. He had twenty seven, which is a really good amount for him. But that switch that they had from Monday to Wednesday was a really, really key. I think switching him up on the uh, the defensive end. Yeah, I agree. And, and look, and there's a reason why Kate Cunningham was the number one overall pick back mm -hmm. in, you know, 2021. Yep. He's a great player. I like, I think Kate Cunningham is going to be a great player in this league, but he's also a young player. So you mm -hmm. have to make it tough on him. Um, and <clears throat> I just felt that there was stretches, especially where, you know, Milwaukee doesn't always do the best job on taking away the best player. Um, and I don't think Kate Cunningham's there yet to be like, well, there's nothing much you can do to stop him. He's going to uh -huh. get no matter what. A lot of these are like wide open threes and just easy drives to the basket. Yep. Um, so for a young player like that, like he's not Kevin Durant. He's not like LeBron. He's not like one of those players that – Oh well, you just gotta. He's just gonna score no matter what. So, um, or or even on beat, he's he's not on that level where, um, where he's like, well, he's gonna get his no matter what. Like he's yep. a score. Like Cade Cunningham, it is not there. And Milwaukee didn't make it tough enough on him to stop him, especially in the first half. Yeah, because he still took twenty three shots, which was six more than the next leading guy. Um, but yeah, a lot of just open shots, whether he made it or missed it, mm -hmm. it still is a lot. Yeah. And which brings me to my next two players that I felt like got uh, too many easy looks. Um, before I get to that, actually, especially in the third quarter, I didn't feel as though the defense, <clears throat> it didn't play great in stretches. What I mean by that is I felt Milwaukee and Monday night's game had a great first half. And then all of a sudden it was just like the third quarter happened and it was like lollygagging our way through the yep. game. It was like yep. we had a good size lead, but it was one of those things where I wasn't comfortable enough with our energy level to be like, well, we're going to go. We're going to win this going away. Yeah, a lot of it was they started out really hot, and then it's when they get comfortable, and then they get lazy. Mm. And when they get lazy, they obviously fall apart, which happened a lot in the third, kind of going into the fourth and just ending the fourth overall. Um, big thing is bad passes, bad turnovers, yeah. and just sloppy play, like you said, which was – it's always been like that. It's been like that for years with the Bucks, the third quarter – it's never really been their thing. No, it's not good. And and look, and fans, and it, oddly enough, fans can feel it too. Uh huh. Like, they, it's like they like the lead, but they feel lethargic watching the game because yep, it's so like, they get out of it. But, yeah, so it's like, it's like the fans. If the players start to get comfortable, oddly enough, the fans start to get comfortable. Uh huh. Because like, well, we're up like thirteen, mm -hmm. um, which is nothing like, anymore. No, which no, and, and it doesn't. And and it was one of those things where even Marcus Johnson said on the broadcast, we was like, I'm not liking this team's energy level. Uh-huh. And that we were giving up offensive rebounds, turnovers, 
Um, there was even one point they, <laughs> they had a graphic up that said Milwaukee hasn't scored in like three minutes. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, huh. And then it went to like five minutes. And and when you're watching it and when you're up by so much, that's the stuff you don't notice where, Correct. Gone, where the Bucks haven't hit a field goal last 350. And I'm like, huh, you're right. They, they, they just have free throws, but they haven't actually uh-huh. like, put it the ball shot. in the basket. Um, but and and look, I wasn't really comfortable with the lead because um it was 88 to 77 going into the fourth. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't one of those things where I was like, up. Oh, we're going to dominate because I just felt that Detroit, especially in that second half of Monday's game, just had more energy than us. Yeah, it was they the day before they beat the Warriors. So they're hot. And honestly, I can't even hate them. They're two and six, but they look really good. Um, but it was no, they else, do. <laughs> yeah, they got young guys that like, they're ready to go. The two and six record means nothing at this point because you know that you can beat the top guys you just need that comfortable with each other um so play the year out play next year out oh sorry play next year out and i think they're gonna be really good but they came they came to win they almost did but yeah overall i would say that lazy defense was one of the killers that led them to that run they went up 15 and then they tied it and then they went up 16, and then they tied it. So it was, again, back and forth. Who knows what's going to happen? But a lead in the NBA is never a good lead anymore. You can be up 20, 24, and they can be gone by the end of the quarter. Yeah, look, records just don't matter. Records don't matter in the NBA because on any given night, you could be knocked off by even, like, the worst yep. in basketball. The worst in basketball. If you're – and again, sometimes there's a stretch where like you play a lot of games. Like you play like seven seven games, eight nights or something like that. There are stretches where like um you can be knocked off, especially uh-huh. and I've noticed this happens with most teams, especially when it happens on like a West Coast trip. Yep. Where like you're you're playing like the worst team you could possibly think of, and they just beat you. And 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 that's usually where and that's usually where it starts. Where think about the worst team in the league. And after we talked about this before, the Bucks mm-hmm. can beat the Suns a few years ago, and the Suns yeah. were the worst team in the league. They they had some sort of strategy that hmm, that worked really well against the Bucks. Um, speaking of of a couple other players that I kind of wanted to note that I thought um, got too many easy looks, more so Jaden Ivy, but. Uh, Bogdanovich, like, first of all, Bogdanovich is a great player. Uh, yeah, uh, I like him. I like Bogdanovich. Uh, he was great for the Jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't think I didn't forget about that game winner he hit against us a few years ago while playing yep. Utah. Uh, I knew that was going to happen. I remember watching that Whitewater. Knew it was it. Um, but, look, Bogdanovich, like, he, does, he did surprise me a little bit mm-hmm. because he uses his body really well. Like he, like he, he can, he can put the ball on the floor and like put it in the basket. Like he is not just as, he's not just a three point shooter. Yeah. He's got a Joe Ingles kind of mentality. I think someone where you don't think they're going to be like crazy athletic or someone who can't, or I should say someone who might not be able to shoot the ball well, but he's, he's lights out and he's always been like that his whole career. And yeah, 16 shots. He made nine of them. Three threes. He was there to play. And look, Jay Nivey, like, I talked about another podcast. Look, uh, you know, we knew Jay Nivey was going to mm-hmm. be good. We saw him at Purdue. Yep. Um, we knew he was a special player. But I just felt in Monday's game, especially, that I thought he also got too many looks, easy mm-hmm. looks for the basket. Um, and now, look, that could be because. He's not like Cade Cunningham because I feel like he's quicker than Cade Cunningham. Uh, he's a quicker guard that I think Milwaukee, um, with Middleton being out, I don't think they necessarily had that quick guard that can like stay in front of him. If you want to consider Javon Carter a quicker guard, mm-hmm. fine. But 
I just felt like on Monday he was like he was going thousand miles an hour. We could not we could not stay in front of him. Yeah, and he looks good too. He, uh, they did hold him over four from three, but yeah, whether he makes them or misses them, it's still giving open shots where it's you got to figure that out because one time or the other, someone's going to start making every single one where they're going to get hot and keep going and going. But yeah, him, Bogdanovich, and uh, Cade took way too many shots. All right, so we kind of talked about this. We already talked about the not taking care of the basketball. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of been a constant theme this year. Um, and I did have it written down there that Detroit did have nine steals on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you know, so, and I, I think I realized that turnovers in the NBA, they can be a huge deal, but mm-hmm. it kind of, it kind of depends what you consider a lot because in professional basketball playing against NBA players, you're going to turn the ball over. Yeah. Um, this isn't like college where you're gonna have like a three turnover game. Like most teams, I think, uh, would have at least double digit turnovers. So, um, in that game in particular, I feel like it did negatively impact them because almost lost. We almost lost toward the uh-huh. end. But, um, <clears throat> but I I do think that nine steals is too many to be giving up in an NBA game. So you know that that. That for from that aspect, it was bad, but mm-hmm. I think every team's gonna have double digit turnovers, no, like no matter what. So, uh, but I guess it's kind of based on what you would consider a lot, yeah. Because when you think of a steal, a steal is someone grabbing it, it's not throwing the ball out of bounds turnover, it's nine of your turnovers were just from someone grabbing the ball away from you, mm-hmm. so. That adds up whether you got four steals, but you still got a lot more uh, turnovers. Again, the different kind of turnovers is big, especially mm-hmm. when you look at the steal aspect of it. Yeah, so uh, nine nine was too many. So, you know, they got to obviously fix that. Uh, the next one. So I'm not split on this guy. Um, the next guy, the next person I want to talk about was Javon Carter. Mm-hmm. I think Javon Carter's energy level should earn him a spot in the rotation once Middleton comes back. Yep. Now, um, I think we've realized that all Javon Carter can do offensively is hit open threes. Correct. Because I think both of us watched him snake two wide open layups. Uh huh. Um. So. <laughs> wide open. Wide open. It was what it was wide open. He snaked. No one was near him. Nobody. Well, okay, there was a person behind him, but yeah, like, he had the yeah, he stopped. He didn't keep going. He just stopped, go up, miss. I screamed. Yeah, now look, Javon Carter, we we've said this, he's not he's just no like when you think Javon Carter on offense, you think, oh, can hit wide open threes. Hmm. Not oh, premium offensive fire. So um, but what Javon Carter does do well is he does all the little things well to help a mm-hmm. team win. He's a, um, pest. I, he's a pest. Yes. And he did and he picked up several offensive rebounds uh-huh. to um you know to help keep, keep possessions alive. Yeah, because he didn't hit a shot. He had zero points, <laughs> but he had six rebounds, three on offense, three on defense. So he was there, two steals. So he was there, defense, but again, offense just hasn't been there. No, and and look, he hasn't – and <laughs> it's kind of funny to talk about Javon Carter like that because it's like, oh, what could Javon Carter do on offense? Mm-hmm. Hit wide open threes. Yep. If they're wide open. Yeah, or that, <laughs> yeah, that little mid-range two, it's, it has to be open. Otherwise – He's not hitting it. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a ringing endorsement of someone's offensive game. No. Oh, he can hit wide open shots. Well <laughs> – Hopefully, so can have enjoyed the NBA. Uh, <laughs> like, look, he did well. He had a wide open shot. So basically, if Javon Carter were playing at, by himself at a gym and he was like really by himself, good. he'll be able to hit those. But <laughs> we're in an NBA game. We're in an NBA game where he basically has to wait in the corner to <laughs> have someone. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> And it's, right. it's one of those things where it's like, if he's open, shoot it. 
but it kind of can get annoying when he's 0 for 4, 0 for 5, and then he shoots it again. It's kind of like Giannis when he's 0 for 4 on threes and he shoots another one. It's like, okay, like maybe pass it because we're only up by two, but <laughs> yeah, and he's Giannis still is doing stuff. Yeah, Giannis is good for like, oh, well, they're giving me like 20 feet of space. Uh-huh, I'm then shoot it. Up a three. Uh-huh. Clank. <laughs> but yeah, the Javon Carter, if he's doing stuff, he's not getting no rebounds, no assists. He's not just running around. He's still impacting it, just not on offense. Kind of like what Drew was doing earlier in the year, earlier in the year, a couple games ago. Now he's kind of got that, which we figured would happen. But Javon Carter could be a hit or miss. Yeah, hey, he's not Patrick Beverly. He's not just mm-hmm. running around out there. He's actually he's actually doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I hope Coach Boonhoser uses him because he see. He should see how valuable he is to this team. Now, yep. I don't exactly know what the lineup is going to look like because um, because obviously I would assume that Middleton would be back in the lineup. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to think because, like, who's still out? Because, like, Connaughton's still out and Ingles are still out. Two yeah. bench guys. Or throw Chris on the bench and then, and then slowly start. get him back in, maybe a game or two. Because, look, we'll talk about him a little later, but um, – I don't think we should stick with the three guard lineup just based on no, how great it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's just based especially on how, for tonight. Based we'll on how great Allen's playing, it no. We'll talk. About, we'll get into him a little uh-huh. later. But um, that's a whole know, segment. A, yeah, next segment. Uh, <laughs> um, the last one, the last topic I want to talk about for um, Monday for um today's, and actually you can kind of warp these into two games because it was really bad. In the two games against the Pistons, hmm. three point shooting. Um, look, I think we knew going into the season that that once Middleton went out and once Conte uh, went out and once Ingles, we knew he wasn't going to play. That they didn't have many guys on the roster who could hit three point shots consistently. Mm-hmm. That's so, really important. Consistently, Wesley Matthews can hit a three pointer, but not four or five a game. No, like, and that's the thing is, um, and with guys with now like Javon Carter and Grayson Allen and Wesley yep. Matthews, those guys they can hit three pointers. Mm-hmm. They can't consistently hit hit three pointers. Same with Bobby. And, he can have a game where he gets five or six, or he just goose egg or gets one. Yeah, and and look, the Bulldozer now has the system where, like. We don't just take it inside once we stop, once we keep missing the threes, mm-hmm. we keep shooting the threes. Yep. Which I don't, we're not like the Rockets from a few years ago in the, in the Mike D'Antoni system where like uh, we live and die by the three. But also, it, it's a part of our offensive attack that we will keep taking the threes. Um, and it doesn't even matter who, because I don't even, I just don't even think we think about it. Like we could be, um, like even in the third quarter, I believe we didn't on Monday's game. We didn't make a three. I believe we were zero for ten in, in the yep. third quarter, um, which it's it, it doesn't surprise me. At uh-huh. all. They were just chucking them up at that point. It was bad. <laughs> but the big thing is, is that what bothered me was. When they would shoot a three, there would be like 15 seconds left on the clock. And then the next possession, they would give it to someone and then they would score right away in the paint. Where it was like, if you know you're not shooting well, take it to the paint and maybe shoot like every 10 possessions, maybe shoot half of the threes that you've been shooting and just try to push it more into the paint because they kept forcing them, which was not helping them at all. They, I think it was halfway through the third quarter on Wednesday. Uh, they said that they were five for 44 on threes from Monday's game to maybe six or seven minutes into the third quarter on Wednesday. That's, that's it's bad. Tough. But they still blew them out, which blew my mind. How did they do that? 
we'll get we'll get to that one later because again we can warp it. Oh. Well, it is as long as on the top of three point shooting. Um, we're I'm talking about it for Wednesday's game real quick. They started out that game. I believe it was like two for twenty one in the first <laughs> half against Detroit, and they ended up shooting like um, it was ten for thirty eight. 10 for 38. So 26%. Yeah. And I think I had Marcus Johnson say this where it was like, you know, they're shooting a little better in the second half. I'm like, well, okay. Coming from an over. They've 10. had you. Yeah. There's all like, you can only go up from an 04. <laughs> like, like, I don't even know if that's even going up because uh-huh. second half, well, they finished with 26%. Mm-hmm. I that's Yay. still not good. Yay. <laughs> still not good. They made they made like what nine or ten and hmm, what they made. They made like let's see, they made eight in the second half. Uh huh. Which um, they had two in the first half. There was Jordan Nora and it was Drew, and then um, and then the second half it was just it was a lot better. Uh huh. Um, but <laughs> yeah, two in the that. first half. Who would have thought? Twenty six percent. Twenty six percent. Goodness gracious. All right, we'll get into we'll get into Wednesday's game because mm-hmm. Wednesday's game Looks actually that better. better. I thought the first half was just slightly lackluster, but obviously mm-hmm. the milestone in the second half. Um, speaking of Cade Cunningham, I talked about Cade Cunningham a lot. I thought he got too many open looks in Monday's game. Wednesday's game was a lot better because they mm-hmm. all, they held him to ten points. Yep. Only 13 shots, so that was 10 less than he took on Monday, too. So, and based on what they did last game, they probably put Drew Holiday on him? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. The whole so, game, I think. See, that. Or when he was in. Yeah, sometimes I don't get what Boone was just trying to do with the defense. Sometimes he, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's trying to get too fancy or just doesn't think about it, that kind of stuff. But um, it, it is good to see him uh, make that adjustment. Because I just don't think it's not that Grayson Allen doesn't try. It's just he he's not a good defender against guys who are taller than him. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I think he's relatively fast, but he's just not as good of a defender as Drew Holiday is. No, which is Hard understandable, do, but yeah, you can't put him three inches taller, two inches taller and faster. It's, it's not going to work. Yeah. And by the way, it's really hard to be as good of a defender as drew holiday because Mm -hmm. he's elite because nobody can defend like him. Mm -hmm. He has quick hands. Yeah. And like think about a guy who, um, who like, who like can defend all five guys. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I think yeah, because he guarded KD in 2021 for the the playoff round. He did it well. Yeah, and KD uh, on JJ Rex podcast called Drew Holiday like, like one of the best defenders mm-hmm. he's ever gone up against. It. So again, we're not asking. We can't ask Grayson down to be like Drew Holiday because it's impossible. Because like, you know, some he just. He's just always been like a really good defender, but obviously he's, you know, coming to his own being elite. Yeah, we need him to shoot and we need him to make them because he's not doing that right now. Oh, not no quite. one is. Not quite. He hasn't, he hasn't found his offensive game yet, but, mm-hmm. you know, obviously if, you know, it's because he has to carry most of the offensive load, which really isn't a good role for him, in my opinion. Um, I think he's good being a third score, mm-hmm. um, really outside of Giannis and Chris. And I, I would put, uh, Brooke Lopez as like a better scorer. Than yeah, him, so. I would agree. Yeah. So if he could be like a complimentary fourth or fifth score, I think that's more of his role. I just don't think he thrives in carrying the offensive load. No, that's like Javon Carter trying to run the offense. It's just. Not gonna happen. It doesn't work. It, it doesn't work too well because, um, I don't. I honestly don't think of Drew Holiday as like a, a scoring point guard. Um, I think of, of him as a guy who likes to pass the basketball and get other mm-hmm. people involved. But I don't think of him as like 
He he's gonna go out and get us twenty. Yeah, it's not like going into the or I guess going into the season, we're not asking him for he's not gonna be Giannis hitting at thirty every game. That's not what he's supposed to do. But if he can have a game where he randomly scores thirty, awesome. <laughs> I like that. And and I think that's part of the reason why he struggled a little bit is yep. because we've talked about this, is that the other players outside of Drew Holiday, Giannis, and Brooke Lopez, they haven't stepped up. Like, if, if no. you want to consider guys like Jordan Nora or Bobby Portis having, like, 12 points off the bench, if you want to c- consider that, then chipping in, fine. I mean, I guess it's been working with seven and all, but mm-hmm. – um, it, it's not something that's sustainable. Um, really until Chris comes back. Yeah, it's it's kind of disappointing to see your four guys basically because you got Giannis, Drew, Brooke, and Bobby, who's consistently getting like ten to twelve points and like the same for rebounds. But then it's like three points. Four points, two or zero, where it's it's consistent, but it's like a four-man carry and then just the people in the group project who don't do the work and <laughs> they're getting the A also because they gave two points to the 116 that they scored. Great contributions, guys. <laughs> um, next topic, I've talked about this guy at length. Um, I'm not, I'm not impressed with Grayson Allen. And the reason being now look, I cut him all slack for Monday. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause he did bump knees with Bogdanovich and he hurt and he got hurt and he didn't miss any time. He just had like a bruised knee or something. Yep. But it feels like and I've, and I've thought about this. It feels like. He's kind of like, remember when Demon Chenzo in the bubble where he's just kind of trying to figure out like what exactly his role is? Well, I don't know. It's like he's lost. He's lost. He's trying to figure out what his role is. Um, They're having him shoot like, they're having him shoot a lot, kick out threes. Mm -hmm. And he's good at driving the basketball. He is. But it's one of those things where if he's not hitting threes, and he's being asked to guard guys like three inches taller than him. Mm-hmm. It's not going it, to go well. No, it, like he. I don't say it makes him an inferior player, but um, it, it, it's just one of his. It's one of his weaknesses where he can play defense, mm-hmm. but asking him to go up against guys who, um, well, like I said, three inches taller than him. Um, and if he's not making threes, he doesn't really become like a great part of the Bucks' plans. Yeah, because in the long run and into the playoffs, he had a really good Bulls series against the Bulls. Yeah, but it's there's going to be games where we're going to lose by three or four, mm-hmm. and he has games where he goes like oh for five on three. It's it's pivotal, and in the long run, it could be a huge disadvantage i guess for their team overall but tonight he's gonna drop four three-pointers at least (laughs) i got that feeling that's a good fit now it's a good feeling to have uh look uh personally i think it's gonna be tough against the timberwolves because gobert cat deal ant yeah, what's their record? Let me look. I thought it was. I haven't followed the Timberwolves as much as I wanted to this year with the new team. They're four and four right now. So, well, solid ish. I mean, the, I mean, look, they have some things to figure out too. Yeah, they, they've lost to the Spurs forward. twice. Sorry, go. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're good. No. So, Gilbert is obviously center. Cat's power mm-hmm. forward. A lot of things there to figure out. Um, there was a lot of defensive alignments that they obviously have to figure out. I, I still don't think the Timberwolves, real quick aside, I don't think they're a great shooting team. And I think that's what her yeah. last year in the Memphis series is that I there wasn't shooters who, like, 
oh my god, I should be scared of this person. Mm-hmm. Well, now um, they traded everyone that could have helped to get Gobert. So it's really going to be block the paint tonight because that's where they're going to be going. And look, with the, with two of those big guys, um, I don't like saying Giannis might be neutralized, but it's going to be a little tougher for him to give whatever he wants because mm-hmm. going up against Cat and Gobert, uh, <laughs> th- those two are slouches on the defensive end. Yeah, and it's it's also one of those things where uh, Cat can hit the three ball too, so. Yeah. If Brooks on him or Giannis is on him, they can't like slack off on him because he's still going to be able to get those shots up too. Um, he won the three point contest last year, so he's not afraid to shoot on like some other centers. But yeah, it's going to be really big on if they can hold him out of the paint and maybe force him to take up shots because I'd rather have him just chuck up threes and make a couple than dominate the paint, kind of like Embiid too. Yeah, I think again, quick aside, I think the Bucks best course of strategy tonight, what helps to work against shot blockers is two two things. One, you can either go at them, or two, you can just draw draw them away from the paint. Mm-hmm. So uh Rudy Gobert is obviously more known as a shot blocker than Cat is, but if you could draw those two guys away from the paint. And then, make them yep. guard you from the three-point line, then I think there's going to be a lot of open looks on the inside. Yeah, because Gobert is really good rim protector, but if you can get him out a little bit, I think they're going to have a better chance because, I don't know, he's kind of, like, awkward. He's, like, lengthy, and, like, whenever I see him, like, try to defend, he's, like, flimsy in a way. I don't yep. know if that makes sense, but... If they can get him like out of maybe like the three, four foot radius from the rim, I think that could be big for yep. Giannis, Drew, and even Brooke if they can somehow get him open down there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like Bucks play Timberwolves tonight. Um coming up real soon, actually. Mm-hmm. 9 p.m. ESPN in Minnesota. Um it'll be uh <laughs> it'll be a good one, but uh uh-huh. Keep the train moving here. Um, what are your thoughts on Marge Bochan? Because to me, right now, he's still trying to find his role. Yeah. Um, he. I mean, look, I don't think the Bucks have any set plays for him yet. Uh, because right now, all he's seemingly doing, and again, I'm not signing him. He's just sometimes like, you know, it, he's kind of like what I – like in Mar- Marjan Bochamp too right now, he's, he's kind of like the new guy who starts a job mm-hmm. and he's working with a bunch of experienced people and he's trying to kind of find himself and find his niche or whatever. Uh, obviously right now, all Marjan Bochamp is doing is like standing in the corner and like waiting for the ball to come to him. Um, and he's been, and he's been cutting a little bit. He's had a couple good defensive players, but other than that, um, I still think he's trying to find his role within the offense. So uh, what are your thoughts on Bochamp? Yeah, I was talking with my brother. He goes too fast. And I think he is the kind of guy who, as soon as he gets the ball, he needs to either shoot it or try to score. He's not like really looking around because a lot of them are, like you said, he's in the corner or he's up top of the key or wing. And as soon as he gets the ball, he's shooting it. It's not like a little wait time. It's, I got the ball, I got to score it. So I think he's rushing to the point where thinking that maybe he needs to score right away in order to have that impact. But it's better to just run the offense a little more smoothly instead of just ball, I got the ball, now I'm going to shoot it, or I got the ball, let me just cut right to the paint where he's not really looking for anyone else, but just shooting. So he can be really good. He just needs to slow it down a little bit. Which is tough to ask a young player to do. Uh Um, I agree with you on the rushing part because there was a play in particular that I I just thought about 
It was when Giannis delivered a perfect pass to him, and he didn't, like look in. He like he like took his eye off the ball, and like it fell out of bounds, fell off his mm-hmm. leg. So I do agree with you on the rushing part because that was like a good pass from Giannis, like a good bounce pass, and yep. he just he made he like made a move before like collecting the basketball. Yeah, he's thinking one step ahead. Yeah, and exactly, which is common for all young players to do is that they commonly go too fast uh, because you know I, I don't know if they're afraid for the for sh- the ball to be swatted or um but look th- that was that one play in particular where I was like you're right that he does go a little too fast uh-huh. um but it's not something to worry about like you know we're not gonna be too hard on Bo Champ in his first season uh-huh. because look He's joining a title contending team. There's a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that he's getting minutes. And I think it's like with that where it's like he's in the game, so he needs to like make some good first impression for the fans, but most importantly, your coach and your team. So I think he's got that, ooh, I'm out here really early. The other guys who are also rookies or first, second year players are not getting as many minutes, so I got to do what I can to, I guess, help the team, which is, again, kind of falling apart a little bit. He started off really well with his shots, but, yeah, going too fast or thinking one step ahead before he can get to the current step that he's on. Yeah, and look, Boonehoser has a good strategy with him because he's throwing him in in the second quarter Mm -hmm. where – he could get about like I don't know, like eight to ten minutes or something. He I don't see him like after halftime. Yeah, uh, it's very stagnant. Stagnant. Yeah, yeah. So I I think that's a good that's a good course of action with Bochamp only because of the fact that he's a young guy. Uh, we have a lot of experienced players on this team. We're not as young as people think we are. Mm-hmm. Like, we used to be the youngest team in the league. Now we're the but, oldest, but it's like no. twenty nine years old. So it's like. <laughs> now it's that's not a, that old yeah so, so yeah we're watching these guys these players grow up in, in front of our very eyes because at one point these guys are like in their 24 25 age mm-hmm. seasons and now all of a sudden they're 28 29 27 so um and look Bochamp I like him he hasn't I, he's gonna basketball. be good he's gonna be good he just needs to find his place and again He's on the Bucks, like you said. They're contending to win. He's not on the Magic, where he can just find his spot, find his role, and just go from there. Usually, like to develop a little differently when you're going from the best team to one of the worst teams. So, I uh, yeah, it it makes sense. It's just something to look out for. I think overall, when he's in, when he's playing crucial minutes, sometimes. And look, some of those guys, because obviously Bochamp didn't go to college. So mm-hmm. some of those G League guys can, yeah, while they're playing against other good players, like it could still take a while for some of those guys to like really come into their own. Um, I think the mistakes that Bochamp is going to make is going to be a little more magnified, more so as you mentioned, if you were on the Magic, because Bucks are going to be watched by. Obviously, a lot more people. I mean, not mm-hmm. necessarily ESPN, but like we're going to be on TNT a lot this year. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll probably get a Christmas Day game. Yep. So, in Boston. <laughs> yeah, in Boston. So, it's going to be so whatever Bochamp does or whoever plays for the Bucks, it's going to be a lot more magnified than if you're mm-hmm. playing for like a really bad team because, you know, t- we're contended for titles every year at this point. Um, oh. Let's move on. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so I mentioned Bogdanovich. Um, I mentioned how he had too many ball by baskets in Monday's game. Mm-hmm. But I'm starting to think we talked about Buck Killers, I think, before we started this podcast. I'm going to put him on that list. I, I would he- agree. And here's why. Because apparently in 26 games, he's averaged 16, 16.7 points a game. It feels like ever since he ever since he was on Utah, he's always killed the Bucks. Mm-hmm. And 
I'll say I don't I don't know why because if you can stop his three point shot, like you should be able to stop him. But he's really good about driving to the basket. So <laughs> you know, yeah. you mentioned he hit that three, hit that um hit that three pointer for the Jazz a few years. That a few corner ago. three. Bucks it, killer. Yeah, it's well. He was on the Jazz, and I feel like the Bucks have never played well against the Jazz. They seem to never can never beat them. <clears throat> and again, he's one of those guys where he's in the NBA, but he does not look like he would be in the NBA. <laughs> Had he not be like really tall, he would have just been like your regular nine to five guy. And it's it's those nine to five guys who are insanely good at basketball, like Joe Ingles on the Jazz. Um, yeah, it's one of those game or one of those guys where it's if he can figure out the defense really quick, he will absolutely demolish you and he'll hit a couple threes or he'll drive to the paint or he'll do both. But it's, he's always been a killer and he's a super underrated player. I think throughout the league and has been for the last few years. Yeah. And I, and I agree. And look, he got, Probably lost in the shuffle a little bit because Utah had such a good team with obviously uh, Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. Of, yeah, they come up with Donovan and, too, and even Royce O'Neal. Like, mm-hmm. but Donovan Sneaky was like a great player for that Jazz core right there. Yep, you know, obviously a bunch of playoff appearances. Um, could hit the three, could space the four, so at. <laughs> And and look, there's there's a, there's always certain players in the NBA who does particularly well against one team. I I don't know. I feel like every time I see Bogdanovich, always kills the box. Yep, he is definitely on that list. <laughs> yep. yep. All right. Um, speaking of Wednesday's game, because we were talking about, I was talking about how the nine steals in Monday's game for Detroit, I felt like was too high for Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. I thought they needed to cut that in half. Well, Evan, how much did the Bucks get on uh, Wednesday? Seventeen. Oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so I thought nine steals was too much. Uh huh. But then Let's I look at the stats really after quick. the game. I'm like, Jesus, seven. Okay, so they had seventeen steals. I'm gonna read the stats real quick. Yeah. Giannis had five. Uh huh. Javon Carter had four. Yep. So that's already their Monday's there. game. That's Detroit and two players. Okay, let's see. I'm going to name out these three players. Wesley Matthews, Marjan Bochamp, and Jordan Orr had two. Mm-hmm. Grayson Allen had one. So, now first of all, as I read that list, I'm like, wow, shout out Jordan Orr. God, we've been criticizing his defense. He got two steals. He's been improving. Yeah, he was looking a lot better recently. He's improving on, he's improving on that end. So, uh, good for, you know, Jordan Orr is improving on the defensive end. But and Giannis having five steals doesn't surprise me because you know he's seemingly always in the passing lanes. Mm-hmm. So I'm not particularly surprised about Giannis's uh, performance. Uh, <laughs> seventeen steals. Woo. Yeah, it was like one of those things where they don't really mention it throughout the game, and then all of a sudden you just see like seventeen steals, or that was Giannis's fifth because no one's really like paying attention to that as the game goes by. Um, it's just one of those things that pops up and you're like, Hmm, that's, that's a big number for something that that number shouldn't be that big, but yeah, five <laughs> steals for him and four for Javon. That's what the Pistons had the other day where we're like, Oh, great. Nine steals, but double it really quick. Yeah. And I joked, I was like, what did Detroit say to Milwaukee after mm-hmm. After Monday's game, because it felt like Milwaukee in Wednesday's game, especially in the second half, had one of those Michael Jordan, I took it personally moments. Yep. Because they took it to Detroit in the second half. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 17 steals in an NBA game. Now look, it's funny because the NBA is so like offensive driven that for a team to just even have the ability to get 17 steals – because you feel like more fouls are being called, being called in the defensive end, is that was hilarious to me. Like, like, and like you mentioned, steals is like you know one of like they just kept taking the ball from them. 
Uh, it was, and it was so easy too. It was, there were so many just missed passes or bad dribbles where you could just sneak your hand in and then they came out with the ball. I know Javon did that a lot where a guy's driving and he's waiting for it and then he'll just, it's that quick little tap that just knocks it loose. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Milwaukee's 17 steal performance, really insane. Um, <laughs> great defensive performance from Milwaukee on Wednesday night. All right, moving to the last topic, um, because I because I brought up this topic, I added this late because I was reading an article written by Eric Name of the Athletic, who covers the Bucks, mm-hmm. and he essentially was talking about the Bucks, uh, the Bucks um, offensive rebounding for the Bucks is a priority this season, um, and what he was referring to was the fact that. Mike Boonehoser throughout his coaching career, um, you know, when he first started off in Atlanta, didn't like to go off after offensive rebounds. He thought, you know, you shoot it, the other team should go back. Yeah, so that's right why back his, on defense. So that's why um, – so, yeah, let me try that again. When he was coaching Atlanta, his mm-hmm. teams were bottom five. This year, um, they are seventh with a 38 or 39% offensive rebounding rate. Mm-hmm. And some of those guys, uh, specifically Bobby Portis, are referred yep. to as garbage men. <laughs> they do the cleanup work for uh-huh. her um, to get extra possessions, offensive rebounds, stuff like that. So what I was really reading about is, essentially, if a ball goes out in, like, say, straight straightaway three, if, like, say Javon Carter and Grayson Allen are in the corner, they're taught, both of them, to cross the offensive glass, get a tip out, and get an extra possession. Which sounds so simple, and yet Mike Bullenhoser never really employed it in his coaching uh-huh. career. But it, it's becoming it's become more of a priority this season, but I feel like it's become more of a priority since he became the Bucks coach because uh, the highest the Bucks. Um, have had for offensive rebounding was 12th in the NBA. So, um, and, and look, it's good that we have those players like BP mm-hmm. and Javon and even Drew Holiday and Brooke Lopez to give us extra possessions. Yeah, and especially for Bobby because a lot of those offensives that he's getting, he's putting right back up and he gets an and one or he just scores maybe not a foul or fouls that aren't called. But it's not like the ones that bounce off and then they fly off six or seven feet where you got to like run a new play. He's right there. He's grabbing them and he's going right back up. So it's, I should say like over the game or over the course of the game, if he gets four of those and maybe two of them go in, that's just an extra four points. that They may not have had uh, later on in the game, which can be crucial if you got those like one, to two score games uh, near the end. Yeah. And, and exactly. And, some of those offensive rebounds we, we kind of didn't notice because I think we were looking at the game winning shot. So, for an example, mm-hmm. the Wesley Matthews is game winning three against uh, Philadelphia. That was off an offensive rebound. Yep. Uh, I, where are we going to add? I think it might have been Grayson Allen. Or um, been. I don't know if he had it. I know he made the pass. It might have been him or Bobby at that point. M- might have been. Could have been Bobby or might have been Drew Holiday too. Uh, anyway, but that was based on offensive rebound. And the one that I remember was uh, off a of miss against the Hawks. Uh, Brooke Lopez had a, like tried to grab it with both hands. And he tipped it to Giannis. Giannis was able to go for the dunk. So Milwaukee has done a better job of getting offensive rebounds. And look, I think it's like a that's like a team thing too. Like I think Milwaukee has the personnel to go after offensive rebounds with really taller guys like Brooke and Bobby mm-hmm. um, and especially tenacious guards like Javon Carter and Grayson Allen and Drew. Um, it, it, it kind of fits into the Bucks uh, culture there. Yeah. And especially with guys like Brooke and Bobby who are big bodied where they're not afraid to like jump on the ball or really like go for one. I think it's going to be big just to kind of, keep that mentality going the the dog in them you know (laughs) where they they're not afraid to just go after it or just not they don't shy back like bobby will go he'll grab one and then if it's a home game he gets everyone hyped 
right after he grabs one. So it's it's big for him and just the whole chemistry on the court in general. Yep. Uh, Evan, anything else? Um, I think the Bucks are going to win the night. But I think the killer is going to be Anthony Edwards. I think he's oh, going to have a good game, man. which isn't surprising. But I think I think Giannis is going to continue with his 30 streak. And I think they're going to win 104 to 98. I'll go with that. Um, I think I also think the Bucks are going to win. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go 107, 100. Um, okay. I think I still think it's going to be a high scoring game. Yep. I don't um, think it's going to be more than 10 for win or loss for any team. No, probably, probably not. But, you know, like I said, anything could happen. And, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully the Bucks win. But <laughs> if they, if they don't, they don't. They've been seven and yep. oh, they've had a really good start. So, and I, um, I believe if they win tonight, it'll be their longest consecutive win streak to start a season. I think seven is like the max that they've done a few times. So I think they win tonight. It's a new streak. Yeah, last time they had seven was the 2018 to 2019 season, yep. I believe, which um, had them, which actually ended up in an Easter Conference Finals appearance against the Raptors. We don't talk about that here. Yeah. But we're just saying it was a good year there. So, uh-huh. uh, uh, yeah. So, um, this has been Milwaukee Bucks on Tap podcast, episode five. Um, Corey Moe and Evan Burned, and we'll see you guys next week.